This is the Build Wealth Canada podcast, session nine, part two. Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to session nine, part two of the Build Wealth Canada podcast. This episode is a continuation of my interview with Justin from rootofgood.com, who actually managed to retire at the age of 33. In this episode, Justin continues to share his tips and tricks of how he did it. And if you missed part one of the interview, you can download part one for free by going to buildwealthcanada.ca slash nine. So just the number nine. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter so that you're the first to know when you expert interviews like the one with Justin come out. And of course, we will also send you a nice free welcome gift just for signing up to the newsletter and becoming part of our community. Well, I look forward to seeing you there. And now let's get to part two of the interview. So if you were to go back to when you made your first investment and you had to give some advice to your former self, your younger self, what would you do? What did you, uh, what advice would you give? I think I figured out investing pretty well once I had some real money, Mm -hmm. um, the I think I would probably go back and tell myself when I first started investing back in um, late high school, early college years. Um, I mean, very little money, but um, I, I would probably just stick with something easy like passive index funds and and low cost. Um, I started out with a, a money manager just because that's who my family had used, mm-hmm. and and the, just the commissions and fees on that were a lot higher than what I could have received at Vanguard. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I literally spent thousands of dollars on unnecessary fees that that could be five or six or eight thousand dollars now, mm-hmm. get given um, compounding over the years. Um, and I, I, I certainly didn't do any better because of having a money manager. Um, and a lot of that was just buying stocks through a money manager and and putting money in a, a loaded a, a mutual fund with a load and high expense ratio on it. So mm-hmm. um, there there wasn't any special access by by talking to a money manager at all. Um, that would be probably the only thing that I would say is, is figure out how to invest on your own. Um, and there are so many more resources today than there were back in the late nineties and early two thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it's incredibly easy. There's, you know, there's, there's ETF exchange traded funds, um, low cost index funds. I, I'm not sh- I mean, I'm assuming you guys have access to the Vanguard or something equivalent in Canada. We do. Yeah. Van- Vanguard's in Canada now as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's you know that's that's what I tell everybody to go with, um, and they have um, life strategy funds here anyway. They have they're called life strategy funds or target retirement funds, and they're they're kind of the all in one fund. If you don't want to, uh, if you don't want to even think, they're a little bit more expensive than what you can do on your own, mm-hmm. but way cheaper than than hiring a money manager. Um, mm-hmm. And and they have questionnaires where you can figure out how you want to invest based on your. Um, Based on how risky you are as a person, what, what's your taste for for uh, risk right. uh, to get you in the right asset allocation? Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be my only advice to my to my eighteen mm-hmm. year old, twenty year old self is to um, pay very very close attention to the the fees and the cost of investing. And it it's I think that's because when you have say if you have a million dollars, um, a one percent difference in fees is ten thousand dollars per year. Right. Um, which is a, a, a huge amount of money to me. I mean, $10,000 is a, a few months of living expenses for us. So to think about giving that away for someone that you may sit down with a few times a year, or you may get a phone call from um, on your birthday or whatever, but um, it, it's, it, we, we, we do very little actually with our investments. They just mostly sit there and generate dividends and grow over time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it certainly pays, you know, if you can think about getting paid $10,000 a year, if you have a million dollars, you get paid ten thousand dollars a year just to understand investing. So, so you spend the time up front one time to right. figure out how to do it, set it up, and then let it just sit there, and you get paid ten thousand dollars a year for doing it. Um, that's a huge, big deal. Now, if, if you're if you're eighteen or twenty and you're putting your first thousand dollars in a mutual fund somewhere or ETF, one percent of a thousand dollars is ten dollars. Nobody cares. I mean, you, you know. You, you, you don't save a lot of money, but it's that that's that long term impact of, of saving a percent or more for a decade on, on your investment fees that that adds up. Well, I say decades, decades and decades. Um, 
thousand. Exactly. Uh, saving one percent. I mean, it's over a lifetime. It's exactly. It could be it's, it's not a one-time fee, right? It's a it's right. a recurring it's a fee every single. So as your portfolio grows, you're paying more and more and more for sure. And and for for our Canadian viewers, if you're wondering, well, the, does this apply to me? How are how are the fees in Canada? Well, actually, um, Canada has some of the highest management fees when it comes to mutual funds uh, in the world. It's, it's some of the highest here. Um, and so if you're wondering, if does this apply to Canada? Uh, it especially <laughs> applies to Canada. And so it really is in your best interest. And uh, that's one of the reasons we, we have this podcast and we have the Build With Canada blog is just to help uh, bring some of these experts on and, and, and teach uh, fellow Canadians how to do this properly. Because unfortunately, if you don't invest that time, you're just you're you're basically getting taken to the cleaners, or it's very easy to get taken to the cleaners uh, and just pay a ridiculous amount of fees. And and you know you just work hard for your money, you invest it, and then you have so much less to show for it years down the road just because you didn't pay attention to this one one little fact, which actually isn't so little, even though it looks like it's little because oh it's one percent or two percent, you know that's two dollars out of a hundred dollars. Who cares? But you, know, you really should care because it, it really really adds up. Um, for sure. No. So thank you for bringing that point because uh, it's it's a it's a killer when it comes to us Canadians and and it really really applies to us for sure. Um, yeah. If if there's anything that um, that you would do, is there anything you would do differently um, now that you've had your wealth of uh, of experience and now that you're retired, anything you would have done differently, but, but whether it's investment related or not, just something uh, some wisdom you've learned through this whole experience. Yeah, um, I don't know if I would do anything differently as much as um i think i think one thing i i think i did okay with this but one thing i was reading somewhere online recently about someone felt like they were constantly waiting for the future to happen and uh and they 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 wanted to there they said well wouldn't it be cool if i could just fast forward my life to when i'm retired early in my 40s or whatever and and uh then they caught themselves and said well, wait a second no then i'm gonna miss my kids growing up i'm gonna miss um, all the fun stuff that I could be doing now when I'm in my, my twenties and thirties. Um, so yeah, it's crazy to think that you want to fast forward your life. And, uh, and I think really get, getting that mindset of, yeah, setting up, a uh, um, setting up your investments and, and planning and hoping for financial independence and, and early retirement, whether it's in your thirties or your forties or whatever. Um, that's really the, the a long-term goal. And you shouldn't sacrifice your your quality of life um, in your twenties and thirties just to reach this goal that's twenty years off. Um, that's not saying you should spend all your money and go crazy and um, what's the saying? YOLO. You only live once. <laughs> right. Uh, that's not to embrace that philosophy uh, because you can do lots of free stuff that's still fun and, and still save tons of money. Uh, but it's but it's more to be. Um, be cognizant of, of how you're spending your time every day uh, while you are saving. Make the most of that. Um, enjoy life while you are young. Not necessarily spend all of your money, uh, but but you know do do the take take that crazy trip if you really want to do it when you're young. Because um, when you're 30 or 40, you may have kids and and mm-hmm. uh, a, a mortgage and a house, and, and you may just not be able to take two months off and go go backpack through Europe or. Um, drive across the United States or whatever. Um, so I, I think there, I think there's some maybe balance is what I'm looking for. Um, finding that sure. balance between getting comfortable to to kind of put your savings on autopilot to get you where you want to go long term um, over decades or decade or two. Uh, balancing that with the need to um, live today and enjoy this month and this year, um, spending time with your family and friends and 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 uh. I think really that that's probably the biggest thing. I think I did okay with it, but it's mm-hmm. it's always it's one of those things you have to keep that in mind. Otherwise, you can you know you can blink and then oh it's next month or it's next year and and what I just spent the last year doing right, um, exactly yeah. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for sure. Or even taking it further and people that kind of are saving that trip maybe till they're sixty five or something like that. And then, yeah. well, you might not be healthy enough to travel by then, or you may have a, a broken hip or something, right? Or you might not be able to to do those, you know, go ziplining or skydiving or or snorkeling for medical reasons, let's say, right? Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, if you're gonna do it, it's it's a good idea to, like you said, have a balance. Don't don't get too yeah. extreme on either side, essentially, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, one other question I had too was, uh, so it sounded like when I was reading your blog that you, um, you decided to focus on investments as opposed to paying off your mortgage as quickly as possible. Uh, is that just because you found you, you were able to get a better uh, return essentially and that's why you took that path or, or can you give us your, your thought process on that? Sure, yeah. The, the, the mortgage, we actually still have a, a small mortgage right now. Uh, the goal was always to roughly time the mortgage payoff with um, early retirement mm -hmm. and we came pretty close. I think we still have, we have a little bit less than two years left to pay on the mortgage right now. It's, I don't know, thirty thousand dollars or something, um, but but we would we would refinance um, as the interest rates dropped over the eleven years we've owned our house. Um, we refinanced, and so we went from a thirty year to a fifteen year um, to a ten year to a five year mortgage. Okay. Uh, so so we've we we've refinanced um, to which increases our payment, but it lowered our interest rates, and and you get even better rates the shorter term you go. Okay. So we. Uh, we ended up in a, at least you know, down here whenever we were doing it. It was always it, it paid to go shorter if you want to pay it off, and so we're like, yeah, it'd be nice to not have a mortgage in in retirement, um, just so you don't have to worry about funding that yeah. as a fixed expense because it's it's you know you can't really just not pay the mortgage exactly um, and live there. So um, that's one thing that we could we can cut our expenses you know to twenty four thousand a year maybe for a year or two and just delay spending and delay maintenance and that sort of thing. But with the mortgage, we'd have to pay it or lose the house. So, right. so the goal was always to sort of pay it off when we retired early and we missed it by about, about two years. But, um, so we still have a little bit left on the mortgage. Um, and, and that was one of those set asides I was talking about when I, I said we need more than a million dollars. And part of that is to pay off that, that remaining mortgage balance. Um, but at 2% interest, I'm not really in a hurry to pay it off. Mm -hmm. Uh, just because it's, it's, um, pretty good odds that we'll make more than that in the stock market. Um, so, and, and for a while, I mean, we, we always focused on paying down the mortgage in the sense that we wanted to gone by the time we retired early. Um, and I, I put some extra payments toward it here and there when I just thought, well, maybe the stock market's at a, at a peak. Um, in hindsight, that was less than optimal. Um, that was probably about 30 or 40% ago. Um, so we, we, I avoided 2% interest for a few years and lost lost out on 30 or 40% investment returns, but mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a lot of money. It was a few thousand dollars here and there. We, we paid off early, but um, so yeah, I, I think, I think mortgages are, you know, it's just what you got to get comfortable with. If you want to have that fixed expense in retirement, mathematically, it's probably makes sense to get a 30 year mortgage as long as you can, possibly can and then invest the money, mm -hmm. invest what you can invest. And then you'll probably come out ahead, but, you always have that fixed expense every month to pay off. So um, for us, it just didn't make sense. Right. And, and, and also, I mean, houses are so cheap where it's it's really rounding error here where, you know, do I have an extra $150,000 from my house if I could borrow the full value? Um, and it may only be one hundred and thirty, hundred forty thousand. I don't know. But mm -hmm. um, if I take that and I invest it, yeah, I'm going to make slightly more returns. But um, it's it's not it's it, it, in terms of long term thinking it doesn't really make a, a huge huge level of difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And then I remember reading on your blog too. You mentioned that you actually used to uh, rent out, uh, I guess, your house to college students as well, right? You 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 played landlord for a bit as well. How did how did that work out for you? How how did you find that experience for those well, interested we, in renting out uh, in doing <laughs> getting into student housing? <laughs> it it was um it was. Good overall. Um, we, we bought a condo in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, um, when we were going to school there. Um, so we bought a condo and got a great deal on it. And then we tried to sell it. And um, I think it was 2004 or so. And it, the real estate market wasn't very good at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't sell it. So we just rented it out instead. Um, and ended up selling it a year or two later, a few years later, maybe about two years later. Uh, we sold it with the tenants still in it. So we sold it to some some California real estate investors mm -hmm. that were cashing in the California market right. just in time. Um, so they bought it sight unseen uh, with a tenant in it as a positive cash flow investment. Um, so it made money for us. I mean, our mortgage was very small and, and the tenants paid, I think it was $750 a month. Um, they were great. It was two PhD students, um, two girls, um, very, very neat, very clean. Um, they paid the rent on time every month. They had they had a PhD research stipends, so um, you know it, it was 
overall it was a good experience. It was just, um, it was just a hassle to maintain it. And, and part of that was because I, I wanted to maximize my return. So I did all the work myself. Right. Um, and it, was a, it was a 40 minute drive to, to go, go check on things, mm-hmm. uh, if it help. But, um, and, and if I look at it like a job, I mean, per hour, I was making a ton of money from it, but it was always just that, okay, well now I have to spend a couple hours a driving pain. up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I tell young people that ask about real estate, I say, you know, if you want to do it, devote your time to it, you can make a, a good, good bit of money in it. You know, if you're in the right markets, our, our market here in Raleigh is, it's pretty easy to make money in because the values are low enough and the rent's high enough. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, like I got just to throw an example, this, you could probably buy a house like mine here for between a hundred and 140,000. If you want to, on a lower end, you have to fix it up some, but, and then you can rent it out for about 1200 to 1250. Oh, that's amazing. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I could literally uh, just walk around and buy houses all day. And if I don't mind being busy, I can make a, a, a bunch more money than what we have that right is now. That's crazy. Wow. That's amazing. And, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that's what it's very, you have to know what you're doing because, um, mm-hmm. from what I understand that, that ratio to, um, purchase price is much worse in Canada, Toronto, oh, big, yes. big city areas. <laughs> Um, you, you know, you, your rent might be that much, but it might cost half a million dollars there. Oh yeah. Uh, so it, it's just, I mean, real estate's just, I don't know, for whatever reason, it just doesn't cost that much, mm-hmm. um, around here. Uh, but, but you know, there, there it's, it's a job. It's, I don't, I don't think of real estate as passive income. If I, if I went and hired a property manager and started paying maintenance men and, and treat it like a pure business, um, I might make 12% a year mm-hmm. versus, nine or 10% in, in the stock market long term. So right. um, if I ever get bored and really want to do it, you know, I may go out and buy up some rentals and, and right. do it. But it's, I think it would just be sort of a real estate hobby. Uh, I mean, I still want to get much better returns than the stock market. So I would have to make sure I'm getting the right properties and, and exactly. know what I'm doing. And, and I'm, I'm just, I'm not a professional real estate investor now, but I know enough about it to know, um, you have to do your research, do, do your dil- due diligence, and um, it may may not make sense at all to buy real estate where you live, but it may be a lot better investment in some areas of um, your country or some other country. I don't know about international real estate investing. I'm sure there are so many issues with that in terms of taxes and, and uh it, the hassle may not be worth it. It's a, yeah, it's a whole other uh, ball game. It's definitely not a even if you have a property manager, it's still I still wouldn't consider it a, a passive investment by any means. It's 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 a, I mean you you contrast that even if you have a property manager to going online and purchasing ETFs which you can do in right. a few minutes, right? Uh so it's just it, it's a huge it's a whole other thing, right? But uh, but yeah, yeah, for sure there's money to be made if you can do it right and it's the right area for sure. Hey, we have we, I mean, just to put it in perspective too, we have 11% of our portfolio invested in the United States and international real estate investments um, mm-hmm. through real estate investment trusts. Right. So we're, you know, we already have a, a I don't know, one hundred and thirty, one hundred and forty thousand dollars um, tied up in real estate through our investments. Plus our house, our primary residence here is another one hundred and thirty, one hundred forty thousand um, dollars. So we we have a significant part of our net worth already tied up in real estate as is. Um, so it's not like we're not getting exposure to those exactly. assets. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a good way to make money if you're in a, the right area where that where the rent is high compared to the purchase price. Right. You could, you know, I could buy ten properties and manage them myself, and and hire a handyman part time, and mm-hmm. and um, spend maybe spend twenty hours a week handling different stuff, and mm-hmm. and, and make a ton of money. Um, and I may do that someday. I mean. Yeah. I, you know, that's always a possibility. I feel like I'm living in the wrong city. You're, you're making a, you should work for the, your city's tourism board because I want to, I want to live there now. Get, buy a nice house for 150 K, uh, you know, <laughs> rent, rent, buy a few more, rent them out. This, <laughs> and, and yeah, and I've, I've seen people that, um, our landlord in college, I mean, he was a pharmacist and he owned, I think 10 or 12 different, uh, rental houses around town. Wow. And I mean, he probably, I'm sure the rental houses are paid off by now. This was 15 years ago. I mean, he's, wow. he probably owns 10 or 12 houses or more free and clear. So a million or $2 million worth of real estate um, that's sitting there collecting 
you know, eight thousand dollars a month gross, maybe more. I, I don't, you know, have no idea how he's doing now. But yeah. if he still had those 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 uh, properties, he may be getting eight or nine thousand a month mm-hmm. gross um, on paid off properties. That you know, that's that's plain to live off of down here at least, mm-hmm. uh, more than enough. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely money to be made for sure, um, for sure. And for our uh, listeners who are real estate investors or are thinking about it, just as an FYI, the it, it, it is a whole that well the tax rules get a little complicated if you're purchasing property outside of Canada if you're buying property in the U.S. Uh, a lot of this was was brought to light when the prices were dropping so much in the U.S. and so a lot of Canadians wanted to go and just buy up cheap property in the U.S. and so the government's sort of taken action uh, you know regarding that and and so it is something that you definitely want to seek the professional help with. Uh, from a taxation perspective, uh, at least, uh, just because it is something where you might feel you're getting a great deal, but once you you look go through all the details, it turns out that maybe it's not as great of a deal, just because of those extra complications. So just something, just something to keep in mind. It's uh, it's you know, it's not necessarily a, a quick and easy thing per se. It's something you want to look into uh, pretty thoroughly if you're if you're taking that route. Yeah, for sure. That's great. Yeah. That- that's what I figured it would. I figured there are some huge hurdles to overcome in terms of the legal hurdles and the yeah. structurally how you set it up, and then also the tax issues. Um, but yeah, I always wondered. I mean, from from the Canadian perspective or the European perspective, when the the Canadian dollar and the and the euro was much stronger than the dollar, um, you know, a year ago or earlier, I, I was just boggled why there were not more investors mm-hmm. that were piling into the U.S. Um, just if you wanted a vacation home or whatever, sure. um, when the prices are so low compared to your local currency, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, I mean, to me, I was just shocked that there were not more people. And I think there were a lot um, in Asian investors too in the West, more on the West Coast. But uh, I think there was some of that international money flow. But I guess the regulatory environment and taxation issues probably make it so that it's for the average regular person it's probably not just as easy as, as we would like it to be. I think it might be right. Right. It's it's definitely more complicated for a Canadian to buy U.S. land than for a Canadian to buy Canadian land. That's that's for sure. I mean, and it's a big hurdle, right? You're buying a house, you're spending hundreds of thousands. It's um, or maybe not hundreds of thousands. But it's <laughs> you, it's uh, yeah, just 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 a hundred thousand apparently is uh, uh, you know, yeah. I hear some of these prices, which is just kind of unheard of here, at least where I'm from. So uh, that's great. Well, anyways, I, I now I want to live where you live. This is the Canadian government won't be happy because you're promoting the U.S. too <laughs> too nicely. <laughs> this is supposed to be for Canadians and. <laughs> You're building a strong case to live in U.S. But come for a vacation down here. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's, it's going to be 81 degrees today. Here. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. Well, Canada has some nice, nice stuff too, for sure. So yeah, yeah I, yeah. I still love Canada, but yeah, for sure. Sometimes you hear about these things in the U.S. and uh, and, and you know makes investors uh, salivate a little bit. Uh, I just, I just keep telling myself that. Well, we've got the the healthcare I like here, and and so uh, that, that makes me feel a bit better when I hear about some of these. Missed real estate investment opportunities. <laughs> Whatever yeah. I got to tell myself, right? <laughs> so uh, one other thing, uh, I, I know we're getting a bit long here on the interview. Do you still have time, or, or should we should we pack up soon? Yeah, I'm I'm free. Oh, okay, I'm free. sounds good. I just I, I was reading your blog, and you mentioned uh, that you you got quite a few scholarships when you were in in uh, in college. Uh, you said you got I think you said you got eleven scholarships in total. Um, so that's that's pretty impressive for sure. I uh, was wondering if uh, for any student listeners or soon-to-be student listeners, if you have any tips for them regarding scholarships. I know it might be different in Canada, but I'm sure there's a lot of transferable uh, tips as well, um, such as start applying for them because a lot of people don't apply to it because it's 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 it's, it's extra work. But we're talking about getting thousands of dollars for an essay, basically, right? So, yeah, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> um, and, it, and it's really, yeah, I mean, it's as simple as... Uh, a 500 word essay or a 1000 word essay, which is, um, two to four pages, maybe double space, something like that. Um, uh, but potentially an hour to an hour or two worth of work, right. uh, to, to make it a nice polished 1000 word essay. And, and, um, and how long do you have to work at uh, a subway or, or, or wherever, you know, or at a campus pub to make that kind of money, right. To help pay for your tuition. Yeah. And at least down here, I mean, the, the scholarships, are generally tax free income, and then your your subway your your minimum wage um, eight nine dollars an hour whatever you get at the at the working for the campus bookstore or at the subway or whatever 
um, they take out taxes on that, um, even just payroll taxes. And so it's, it's even, it's even more in favor of getting scholarships. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the return per hour, I mean, even if you wrote 10 essays and spent 20 hours on that and then only got back one scholarship for a thousand dollars, um, that's still 50 bucks an hour. Right. Exactly. And, And I'm, I don't know how many scholarships I submitted, but the, the success rate there was way higher than one in 10. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you look from the other side of it, there are so many scholarships that just have very, very, very few applicants. And especially the more concentrated you get into a specific focus area, um, especially if you're in, if you're in any of the science or engineering fields, um, a lot of, a lot of companies, um, have a lot of tech companies will sponsor scholarships, maybe not in their name, but, but, in some sort of organization they'll, they'll donate to a professional society scholarship. Um, I got a few that way and it was, there was maybe 10 scholarship applications for three or four different scholarships for, um, the, the transportation engineering society I was in. And they they were always begging people, please apply for these scholarships. We don't have enough applicants and we have too much money. Please <laughs> apply for these scholarships. And, and I, I mean, I, I think I got, yeah, like I said, two or three of those, um, just because they had so few applicants, it was hard to find people to give money to as, as weird as that sounds. Mm -hmm. And that that wasn't even an essay. That was just filling out a one page form and handing it to a professor. (laughs) Uh, And, and I mean, it wasn't, I mean, I had good grades and so that, that certainly helped a lot, but people that were in the very, very much in average grades, um, they were receiving these scholarships too, because there just were so few applicants in this specialized uh, field of engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I applied for one for, I think Scottish, Her- Scottish heritage or something. Cause my last name is, is Scottish sounding. So, um, <laughs> I wrote an essay for that. And I mean, I don't know hardly anything about Scotland, honestly, but, um, that was 500 bucks. Um, <laughs> just, uh, the, a few through the university that didn't require essays. And then uh, there were a number of them that required essays that, um, I, I probably got a third of maybe a third or a quarter of the ones that I wrote essays for, but, mm-hmm. but, you know, doing that math of if I spend two hours per essay and write four essays, so I spend, I spend one work day, one eight hour day, and then I get a thousand dollars back or $2,000 back for that. Mm-hmm. That's just a ridiculously good use of time compared to working at a minimum wage job. Sure. Um, it, and it, and it, you know, it doesn't hurt to try to get these scholarships and, and maybe a good strategy is just to apply for one a week or, or whatever, just to have a shot at it. Um, and I'm sure there are tons of online sources to, to help you search for these scholarships now, uh, m- more so than what we had back in around 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, but the main thing is to get your name out there and apply because you, you never know when your application will be something that, that may catch the eye of one of the applicant uh, application reviewers. And they'll say, hey, this person is, you know, this, they, they did this or they did that. Or, hey, my kid does this too. This would be cool to give them this scholarship. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that I, I think it's just applying for them and, and strength in numbers. The more more you apply for it, the more likely you are to get one. For sure. I, li- I like that approach, the thinking about Because it, it's hard to get motivated to write even more essays and, you know, fill out boring application forms. And uh, so, so I, I see how it's not all that appealing. But I really like how you brought up, well, look at it at a per hour basis what are you getting paid per hour so if you know if you're getting paid 50 an hour i mean you know i'm pretty sure there aren't very many people who are just joining university getting paid 50 an hour at least none that i know of so you know when you think of it that way uh, hopefully that 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 motivates uh the students a little bit i think to do this um i guess maybe there's a bit of fear of failure and, and that kind of thing too and so people don't apply to it because they just don't want the rejection um but i mean what's the worst that can happen is you don't get it and the most that can happen is you, you, you're making a ridiculous amount of money on a per hour basis to pay for your schooling. Um, yeah, I, I did a fair bit. I did some scholarships as well. Uh, I got uh, my, my whole first year was, was paid for with scholarships. But I remember um, one. Yeah, like now in retrospect, I should have done it even more aggressively. You know, I kind of went for the low hanging fruit, like the entrance scholarships and uh, got scholarships through my parents work. Uh, through my mom's work. Um, so that, that's one tip I have is ask your parents because they may have a scholarship thing at their work. And who knows if they ask their boss, maybe they'll even create one. Who knows? But but I remember yeah. that was one of my regrets was I, I probably should have done it even more aggressively um, because, yeah, like you said, there's there's a lot of them out there and it's not that 
as competitive as you'd think, basically, because I think a lot of students think, well, my, my grades aren't high enough or I'm not smart enough or there's, there's that one uh, really smart person in their class that you just assume is going to get all the scholarships so you don't even try, right? But, uh, but it's completely possible for sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I even, our, our um, College of Engineering had scholarships, our Department of Civil Engineering, they had scholarships, and it's just filling out a form and, and sticking it on a file. And mm-hmm. I mean, there are people very much people that had average grades and not, not the top students that still got some scholarships. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, you know, if, if you are part of a, um, um, women or minorities, there are lots of scholarships that are really targeted more towards them. Um, um, lower income people here in the U S at least they, there are some that are, um, that they will look at your economic status and, and, and you can get scholarships or grants based on that. So there, there's there's really just a lot of um, I think in engineering and the sciences there's more scholarships than if you're in the humanities, mm-hmm. um, but there are scholarships in, in business school and biology and chemistry and engineering and computer science and I mean all over the place there are scholarships. Um, so yeah, definitely check out what's out there and you know if you have to just sit down one weekend with a bunch of coffee and, and close the door, <laughs> lock it, hide yeah. your cell phone, turn off the internet connection, and just crank out. Um, crank out, I guess you have to apply online now to some of these things, but um, <laughs> somehow figure out a way to not waste time and just spend eight, uh, 16 hours on one weekend and you could probably make thousands of dollars. Exactly. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's great. Uh, that's great advice. Um, one other thing I want to ask you too is on your site, you mentioned um, that you take very, uh, or you're able to find some really good deals on vacations. And so I was wondering if you have some tips to share uh, in terms of getting, um, basically being able to vacation and st- still take nice vacations, but for a lot less than what the average person pays. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I guess there's, there's a few things that you can do, um, for international vacations. Uh, it pays to, to look at foreign exchange rates. Um, right now in, this is March, 2015, um, the U.S. dollar is very strong compared to the euro and, and compared to the Canadian dollar. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and Mexican peso, for that matter. Um, so, for right now, me as an American traveler, I'm looking at um, Canada, Europe, and, <laughs> yeah. and uh, Mexico as um, places where everything is about twenty or thirty percent off. Mm-hmm. Uh, C- come stay in our. Come visit us. Stay in our expensive real estate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll be like, it's you're paying how much place. for this for for twelve hundred square feet? What? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I was looking at at Montreal. We really enjoyed our trip to Montreal last year, mm-hmm. and uh, there, I mean, there there are just ridiculously cheap deals on on um, short term apartment rentals there. Uh-huh. Uh, and I, I've I've used Airbnb. There's other sites out there, but mm-hmm. um, that's another way to save money. Is um, if you some people slow travel. Um, if you stay somewhere for a week or more, you can get a, an apartment rental at, often at much, much better rates than a hotel or, or even a hostel. Mm-hmm. So you said so you slow can travel? Is that, is that what you said? Slow travel? Well, I've heard it called slow travel. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, it, it's it's spending more time in one place right. because you, you that, that way you can spread out the costs of uh, transportation. Um, so if you can imagine flying, um, I can fly to... to Let's say Montreal because I just went there last year. I can fly to Montreal and spend maybe three hundred bucks on a plane ticket for me. Um, let's say my whole family. So fifteen hundred dollars for a plane ticket for five plane tickets. Um, if you spread that cost out over a month, it's uh, it's very little per day, mm-hmm. uh, fifty bucks a day, I guess. Um, but if you're flying up for a long weekend, say three or four days, um, that's five hundred dollars per day. If you're only spending right. three days there. And you're also spending a lot of time traveling to and from and not, you know, I don't like flying on airplanes. I don't think anyone does really, um, unless you're in first class maybe. But um, so, so you, if you think about the that cost per day and amortizing out the cost of the transportation part of it, you're paying a lot more to get somewhere for a few days. But if you stretch it out to a week or a month, which I, I understand is, you know, people don't have vacation time for more than a few weeks a year. Um but but to think about it in terms of what's the total cost of this vacation and, and what's the what's the best way to maximize value, um, if you can stay somewhere for a week or two instead of instead of going to a different city every every day every other day, um, you can you can rent those longer term places. You can rent an apartment that it might be a nice two bedroom apartment that's half the cost of a small uh, hotel room, right. and you also have the advantage of a, a 
maybe a, a nice balcony, a nice walkable neighborhood around there instead of a very boring hotel. Um, you might have cool neighbors that you meet. Um, kitchen, you have a full kitchen, so if you want to cook your own meals, um, even if it's just breakfast and, and sandwiches, and, and you know maybe they have a grill, you can grill out on the back on the back deck. Uh, so that there's that, that's another way that we save money um, is, is traveling slower and focusing on kind of maximizing that that or minimizing that per day cost of travel, right. um, looking at longer term stays, um, n- not taking weekend trips somewhere um, just because that I don't like flying, like I said. And so um, if you're spending a lot of time getting somewhere, you're spending less time actually enjoying and relaxing where you are. Um, traveling on foot is another great way. Um, you can, you can, s- a lot, you see a lot of different things when you're on foot as compared to, um, if you're riding in a taxi or traveling around in a tour bus. Um, and the, I guess the, the other big thing that's available to us based people that probably is available to a certain extent for, um, Canadians as well. Uh, it's called travel hacking and it's basically, um, paying attention to all those airline miles and hotel points that you may or may not use already. Um, making sure that you're getting the most out of those. And we have credit cards down here. You can sign up for a credit card and get a huge bonus when you first sign up. And then, um, you can get one or 2% back in terms of points or cash to use towards vacations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so we've, we've used hotel points, airline miles to get free plane tickets, to get free stays in hotels, um, and it, 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 you know, and it's part of it is an art of finding the maximum value for a redemption. So we might redeem our points and get a huge value per point at a hotel somewhere where it would be really expensive to pay cash, but then somewhere else it might be cheaper to pay cash for a hotel and save our points for, right. for right. use in the future. So it's, there's, you know, if, if you pay attention to that, you can really get a lot more value out of the, the hotel points and the airline miles, um, and make sure you're getting credit for those. If you do, you know, if you are paying cash at a hotel, uh, make sure you sign up for the hotel program because um, some of them just don't take that many points to get a free night out of it. Okay. And, okay. and it and it can really, yeah. I mean, and, and if you're a, if you're working and you're a business traveler, um, paying attention to those the frequent flyer programs and and the frequent guest programs at hotels, um, those those things. I mean, you you can you can have a whole. You can fill up your vacation time that you get each year with free travel if you're a frequent business traveler. Um, and I, I, as far as I know, most employers let you sign up for these things on your own and get credit for it, but I'm sure that varies by company. But um, I never really traveled a lot for business, but I always pay attention when I did to um, getting all those airline miles that I could, getting the um, getting any, any of the hotel stays, making sure those are credited towards my frequent flyer or frequent guest programs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's great. That's great. No, thanks for those tips. So uh, yeah, we're uh, we're coming to the end. And uh, is, is there any any kind of questions that you would have liked me to ask you, or any sort of um, final tips, or anything that's worked really well for you? Basically, anything else that you'd like to you'd like to share? Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess. I mean, I think you covered pretty much everything. Um, I'll just share maybe some parting thoughts. Um, it's, it's best to start thinking about what you want to get out of life early on and set some goals. Um, if, you know, if you're not saving money now, but you want to start saving more, um, start slow. I mean, I, I, I saved my first hundred dollars at some point, you know, it, it, I put that first hundred dollars in the bank. Um, I made my first $3,000 mutual fund at, at some point. Um, I, I, you know, everything starts out slow. So you, you got to kind of, Start somewhere and then build up from there. You don't necessarily have to be an expert when you start, um, but but you know research what you can and, and don't be afraid to adjust course later if you figure out that there's some way to improve what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's probably the best advice I can think of is just to you know evaluate what you're doing uh, financially and in terms of your lifestyle and and, and choices that you're making now um, because it, you know ten years down the road you're going to be ten years older and you might as well be ten years wealthier while you're at exactly. it. Exactly. As opposed to just kind of letting things run their course, not really planning, just live everything, kind of let things fall as they as they may, and uh, yeah, instead just actually planning things out and, and having those set goals and then working towards something. Yeah, for sure. No, I think that's I think that's really really good advice, definitely. 
Uh, Justin, can you tell us, um, our listeners, a bit more about where they can reach you, where they can learn? Um, tell us about your blog, uh, you know, maybe anything that you're working on. Just, yeah, let us know where we can um, hear more from you. Um, so I have a blog at rootofgood.com. Um, it's kind of a mix of personal finance, early retirement. Um, some of it is U.S. tax specific, but a lot of it is not. Um, a lot of it's just about general investing, saving money, making smart choices with money, um, lifestyle decisions. Um, I talk about my kids a lot, how, what it's like to retire early with kids, um, how, how to, how to save money with kids. Um, it's not a parenting blog, but it's, you know, I talk about that some because it's a big part of my life. Um, but, but a lot, there's a lot of, um, you know, I talk about how we save money on housing and maintaining the house and cars and, um, vacations we've taken. There's a good series of uh, articles on our, our trip to Canada last summer nice. and back. Nice. <laughs> interesting getting, getting a an American's perspective on uh, Canada um, that might be culturally relevant to you. How we don't all uh, say a at the end of our sentences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's it was yeah it, it was an experience. It was good. Um, so you know I, I just share a little bit of everything, um, and some of it's just simple stuff like what am I doing today or. What, what you know? What's early retirement offer me today that that I couldn't do when I was working? Um, those sort of things. So, so some some of the some of the hard money number based uh, topics that I'm sure your readers or your listeners would want to see, uh, but also just some of the softer side of you know the, the fun things in life. What are those like? Um, how, how can early retirement um, enhance those things? Um, so yeah, rootofgood.com is the blog. Uh, I'm, I'm on Facebook. I'm on uh, Twitter. Um, Tumblr, um, Pinterest, I think I'm on there maybe, but I don't really use it. So, but yeah, definitely uh, check me out on Facebook or Twitter or rootofgood.com. That sounds great. Uh, yeah, and I'll put all those in the show notes as well for all the uh, for all the listeners. Great. All right, great. Well, Justin, thanks a lot. It was great talking to you. And um, yeah, I hope we'll be able to talk again soon. Yeah, thanks so much, Cornell. All right, take care. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Justin. In case you missed it, you can get the first episode of this interview and all the show notes for free at buildwealthcanada.ca slash nine. So just the number nine. While you're there, just a quick reminder to join our community, become a VIP member for free so that you are the first to know when new expert interviews come out and I will send you new tools and guides as they get released, plus a nice welcome gift just for joining us. Last but not least, if you are an iTunes user, I definitely appreciate you leaving this podcast a rating. I mentioned before in previous episodes, it really helps with getting more individuals exposed to the podcast. It helps bring on better guests to the show. Basically, it really helps the podcast succeed and it's really motivating for me personally to see the reviews. It makes me want to do more episodes and then find more really, really good guests so that we can both learn from them. All right, so that's all for now. See you next week for another episode and take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Build Wealth Canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca. 